organized by UNESCO. Before I say a few words, uh, let me introduce my three colleagues. Um, Maryam Nisbet, she is the director of the Information Society Division. Mr. Mon Smith, he is the Deputy Assistant Director General and also Director for, my God, uh, <laughs> Democracy, Freedom, Freedom of Expression, Peace, and everything else under the sun. <laughs> uh, and Iskara Panevska, she is the newly appointed Regional Advisor for Communication Information at our cluster office in New Delhi. Uh, in fact, uh, she has not even joined there yet, so she came here for, to establish contacts with you. Uh, with that brief introduction of this very gender balanced team, <laughs> um, allow me to uh, share a few um, pieces of information. It's not more than just to update you. The fact that you are here, I'm sure that you are somewhat familiar with what UNESCO does. But let me try to put this in proper context of this Internet Governance Forum. As many of you are aware, UNESCO was a very active participant um, or a partner, in fact, participant would be an understatement, in the process of WSIS. Um, ITU was the lead agency, but along with ITU, UNESCO was one of those UN agencies um, that I like to believe made some significant contribution in terms of content to, and discussion and debates at WSIS. And um, during the preparatory phase and the, the two phases of the um, WSIS in, Tunis, uh, in, in Geneva and Tunis, we talked about the notion of building inclusive knowledge societies, not in contrast to information society, but uh, uh, as an Basically, our emphasis was more on human dimensions of the emerging information society, more on content, more on substance of human communication. And that is how we distinguish that this, because we felt the discussions were more around technology and we thought that, yes, technology is important, connectivity is important, access is important. But what do you do once you have access? What is it that ultimately people want to use it for, to have access to that information? So much so that in a major reorganization of UNESCO's strategic planning, the organization accepted building knowledge societies, inclusive knowledge societies, through information and communication as one of the overarching objectives for the organization as a whole. And because the communication information sector had taken lead in advancing the notion of building inclusive knowledge societies, we were given the lead role but because UNESCO is an agency with multiple mandates in the area of education, in sciences, in culture, and communication information, it is not just one sector that is responsible for it, but there had to be a lead se sector to, to, to take the ball and run with it. So that is the role that was assigned to the sector that I have the privilege of heading. Now, the, the basis of our argument was that creating, preserving, using, and sharing information and knowledge are the most powerful tools for development. As the societies have advanced from agriculture society to industrial society to now what we call knowledge societies, it is the creation, 
preservation, sharing, and utilization of knowledge that is really making the difference in our development today. Now, as I mentioned in the earlier session today on uh, security, privacy, and openness, UNESCO's constitution talks about promoting the free flow of ideas, maintaining, increasing, and diffusing knowledge. This is, this is enshrined in the constitution of UNESCO. So it is not that we've started talking only now. This is when UNESCO was created. It has stayed with us since then. And there are many other discussions and debates on this issue <coughs> in view of the advances in technology. And we do so by performing a series of functions uh, as laboratory of ideas, at catalyst for international cooperation, as a clearinghouse, as a standard setter, and as capacity builder. And within this framework, <coughs> our strategic objectives are twofold enhancing universal access to information and knowledge, and fostering pluralistic, free, and independent media and infrastructure. Um, so to, to the idea of promoting freedom of expression and freedom of information, uh, I will not elaborate on these as my colleagues in their respective areas will discuss this further, um, merely to introduce these areas to you, and then I will ask my colleagues to elaborate them further. Then the second is promoting universal access to information and knowledge. And this obviously cannot be achieved without adequate attention being paid to such issues as multilingualism, as cultural, and cultural diversity, and, and so on. Then our operational work really revolves around primarily in promoting free, independent, and pluralistic media. Because we believe that in order to promote freedom of expression, openness in the media and new technologies. This can happen primarily by promoting free, independent, and pluralistic media. Because we've seen enough evidence that if the media is not free, if it is not independent, and if it is run by monopolies, it tends to restrict the free flow of information and ideas. Then another aspect of our work is promoting cultural self-expression and mutual understanding. This work is directly linked to UNESCO's mission of building peace through international cooperation. And today, you have seen the evidence of the conflict between nations, conflict between civilizations, conflict between cultures and religions and so on. But at the same time, we have very, very powerful tools today to share knowledge and, and information about each other's culture, to enable people to find their expressions of their cultures through the means of communication that are available to them. We know for sure that the younger generation, our children, our teenagers, today spend a lot more time with the media than they spend with parents and school, sometimes put together. And how can it possibly not have an impact on them? Therefore, we believe that these powerful tools must be harnessed to create mutual understanding, to remove suspicion of each other's cultures and and belief systems and so on, 
by promoting because it is often the ignorance of each other that creates conflict. So media and technology, today's technology, have to play a vital role in giving people their cultural self-expression self -expression and creating mutual understanding. Uh, I'm, I hope that uh, some of you at least are aware that there are, we operate through also two international programs, Information for All program and then International Program for Development for Communications Development, IPDC. In fact, our work in the area of free, independent, pluralistic media is uh, largely through this International Program for Communication Development. I think that's, I, I, that, that's where I will stop with my introductory remarks, and I'll um, urge my colleagues, uh, starting with Molly Smith, to talk about freedom of expression, um, use of media in conflict and post-conflict situations, and followed by Maryam and followed by Iskara. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Abdul. Um, just a few words environment for establishing more dialogue, tolerance, and mutual understanding, some of the issues that, um, that I'm administering uh, at UNESCO. Abdul was very kind to talk about freedom of expression, democracy, and peace, and everything else. And, uh, and, and it is a little bit of a broad mandate. On the other hand, it's also quite specific. Because as uh, was mentioned by, by, by Abdul Khan, the, um, the mandate for this field is given to us by the very constitution of UNESCO talking about the free flow of information by word and by image. Um, that again refers back to the uh, Article 19 uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which guarantees all of us those three rights, or the right which has three elements. And sometimes when we discuss this right, I'm not quite sure that we really do think about it in its broadness. Because it is the right to seek actively information. It's the right to express yourself, the right to impart information. And it's the right to receive voluntarily information. And all of those three rights, so to say, are guaranteed regardless of frontiers. So there is no reason for why we should not be able to access freely and actively information independently of where it is actually located. UNESCO's aspiration in this specific regard is to ensure that the space for that freedom is maximized, that it is maximized for the individual citizen, that it's maximized for the press, because when we talk at UNESCO about freedom of expression, we also talk about its corollary freedom of the press. Of course, we know that there exists nothing like an absolute freedom of expression. We know that freedom of expression is ruled by law in, in every single country. And we accept, of course, that there are exceptions to that freedom of expression. That's when it comes to issues that are criminal in a given country. And that's when it comes to issues that are pertaining to the Article 19 of the International Covenant, these limitations to freedom of expression that exist and which are internationally uh, recognized. The key thing for us, though, is that when we work together with governments, and UNESCO work a lot with governments because we are owned by 193 of them, that when we work with governments, we try to make sure that any restriction on the freedom of expression space is based upon a law which has been democratically adopted in the parliament. And furthermore, that that law is in accordance with general international principles and based upon respect for the fundamental human right which is guaranteed in Article 19. When we then work on these issues, we work with them in, in, a, in mainly two areas. And we, I can get, I 
can get a little bit more into that when we have our Q&A uh, session afterwards. But the one area we could talk about, advocacy, awareness raising, and monitoring. We work with how is freedom of expression, how is freedom of the press actually applied in our member states. And we're in a constant dialogue with the member states, their governments, their local authorities, the press organizations, civil society organizations, in order to, to discuss these issues and try to promote, as I said, a maxi, the maximal, the optimal space for freedom of expression. We also work with all these stakeholders, and it's important for UNESCO that we have this multi-stakeholder approach, that we work with governments and with civil society organizations, that we work with them in order to create a, what we call the legal uh, um, enabling environment for freedom of expression, that laws are actually being adopted that are conducive to freedom of expression, that regulatory frameworks, including those that set the rules for internet service providers, for broadcasters, and so on, that these regulations are again according to uh, internationally recognized principles. We also work, and that's the second work stream, on capacity building. We work with representatives from the authorities, from the judiciary, and from the media professionals themselves in order to build the capacity for them to use and respect the, the rules when it comes to freedom of expression. That also means that when we work with journalists, we work with them on professional and ethical standards. How do they actually use their space without abusing their space? How do they avoid bringing themselves in a situation where governments who may be waiting for such an occasion will try to limit their space for freedom of expression because they are getting beyond what is professional uh, journalism? We work on setting up professional organizations because we know that, for instance, media professionals are stronger when they work together. We work with journalism schools all over the world, and right now we have a special campaign going on in Africa on developing a number of centers of excellence in journalism. And we work on the very pertinent issue of the safety of journalists. As you all know, many more journalists than ever before have been killed over the last five years. And this is unfortunately a tendency that sees no real um, stop uh, uh, in, in, in the near future. Then we also have uh, at UNESCO a special uh, uh, responsibility for working with media and media organizations in conflict and post-conflict countries, meaning that we are undertaking quite serious media development organizations together with other UN uh, agencies in countries such as Iraq, Sudan, Liberia, DRC, Congo, Afghanistan, many, many other countries. And we work with them, not just to deal with the here and now issues, but also try to see how we can work together with media in order to foster an environment in which reconciliation processes can take place. So we work with the media, not telling them what to do, but telling them what good professional journalism is all about when it comes to reporting on a conflict in a post-conflict setting, meaning not falling back into incitement, not falling back into very nationalistic propaganda, hatred that can be used to fuel new conflicts. We all know that such a post-conflict environment is highly volatile, and it really, really calls upon the press to work as professional as at all possible. We're also establishing a special network called the Power of Peace Network, which is a network mainly uh, based on the internet, which will provide a platform for mainly young uh, internet media producers to put together various clips, films, sound bites, articles, photos, that all illustrate the power of peace through the medium. And I think that will be what I want to say right now, and I'll pass on to, to one of my colleagues. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mr. Khan has shown you. Um, I think you're probably, though, beginning to get a good sense if you for those of you who don't know us, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, 
a good sense of why UNESCO is here at the Internet Governance Forum. Certainly for those of you who were here um, this morning, who, who heard the discussions about um, uh, privacy, security, and openness, you see how closely uh, aligned uh, the UNESCO and the communication and information sector is with, with those issues, with key internet governance issues. Now, I may need a little help here from one of my technology friends. I'm not, I'm an Apple person, so I don't know how to use these Microsoft products. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. you. You take the, yep. 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 <laughs> we just go, go right ahead. Thank you. That'll take us right there. Um, I just want to hit a few of the highlights um, of the Information Society Division. And um, again, for those of you who were at the uh, sessions yesterday on multilingualism, or even this morning we had a workshop on multilingualism, will have already uh, seen that other connection with internet governance. Uh, but let me just talk about a few other aspects and then just hit the highlights of the multilingualism. Um, the, the Information Society Division works sort of in two, sort of two thrust or two, two ways um, with regard to um, uh, capacity building. One is certainly directly connected with using information and communication technologies to support education, science, culture, and of course development, which was one of the main points that Mr. Khan mentioned in his, in, uh, in his discussion. Um, we, we promote um, activities related particularly to teacher training, um, to low-cost devices, uh, a project that we're working on with InfoDev, um, accessibility issues. Uh, we had a, um, a, a very interesting workshop yesterday that we co-sponsored on accessibility issues. Um, and another area that we're getting into that's certainly very relevant today to internet governance and the use of the internet, and that is um, looking for ways to, um, particularly to promote the use of non-text materials, which is becoming definitely more the, the, way, the, the trend of the future for the internet. <clears throat> Um, one aspect uh, that we very much promote that's the topic of some of the other workshops, MOANS is going to be involved in one, is certainly um, access to public sector information or public domain information, um, certainly another um, important point for getting content out there, particularly government-generated content that should be readily and accessible. That's important not only for schools, for research, um, for education, but also for e-governance, which is another aspect that we're involved in. <clears throat> Information literacy, very, very, very relevant to internet issues. Uh, if people are connected and um, even if they're able to get the content, which is a whole other issue, as you know, uh, I feel sort of like the byword of this uh, particular forum should be content, 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 like location, location, location. Um, if you can't, if you can get connected but you can't get content, what's the point? If you get the content but you don't know how to use it, you're still not going to be digitally literate, you're not going to be information literate, you're not going to be media literate. <clears throat> the multilingualism issue, which has certainly been one of the themes of this forum, um, is absolutely uh, key. Uh, particularly for developing countries. Uh, we, do, we do work in this area in a number of ways. I've listed some here. One that you've uh, heard a lot about is the effort to internationalize domain names. Uh, we're certainly uh, working with that, and we have a piece of that to play uh, in cooperation with ICANN with the fast track development, I mean the tr fast track effort for the internationalized domain names. Uh, certainly as that process goes along, as countries are applying for um, country codes in scripts other than Latin. There's going to be quite an interesting application process for that. 
Um, the technological challenges are extreme, but at the very bottom level, when you get to an issue of what script is used, what script is understandable, which script is going to be used for a country domain name. Um, UNESCO has offered and um, we have been accepted uh, to provide linguistic experts to help in those determinations. Um, I think that's going to be uh, an, important, an important part of what we can contribute to that. Um, Additionally, uh, we have um, a, a number of other activities that relate to uh, l languages. Um, I do want to emphasize here um, one of the major parts of UNESCO, major players of UNESCO that, that participates in the whole area of multilingualism um, is our culture sector. The communication and information sector works very much, very closely with the culture sector. Um, which has a, a, a quite a, a long history of promoting uh, languages, particularly efforts to protect endangered languages. Uh, an effort this year has been uh, uh, 2008, the International Year of Languages, and quite a, quite a bit of activity uh, related to that. <clears throat> One issue that has come up in several of the workshops, of course, is how to promote uh, access in various ways, including access to tools that are needed for internet access, uh, software, um, applications, search engines, um, all of those kinds of things. Those are other areas in which UNESCO has a long history um, of working and promoting uh, alternatives to proprietary. We, uh, proprietary is great, but there should be alternatives, and we're very supportive of that. But additionally, um, we also provide um, actual resources. Uh, the open training platform, open educational resources are among the ways that we do that. Just a little snapshot from one of our web pages about open access, our open training platform, our free and open source software portal, which is very, very big, and digital libraries, a huge effort um, in terms of what we do, promoting uh, digitization efforts, promoting support for libraries and archives. Uh, again, this gets right back around to the content issue. Uh, if there is not content available for people in their languages relevant to their local needs, local to relevant to their communities, um, they're not going to have the incentive to use all the tools that are out there. And the bottom line, creating, accessing, utilizing, sharing, and preserving information and knowledge. The most powerful tools to enable individuals, communities, and people to achieve their full potential. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I would, uh, as Mr. Schmidt uh, said, and it, in this sense I would say it relates very closely to uh, free flow of information and freedom of expression. I would like, uh, uh, well, let me first start by reminding you that this year uh, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, of which Article 19, as you well remember or know, ensures the right of every individual to freely uh, seek, impart, receive information regardless of frontiers. And uh, today's media landscape with the satellite revolution and the unprecedented uh, boom in the use of uh, information and communication technologies uh, provokes uh, very spirited uh, debates uh, across the world about the ever-increasing role of media in our lives. And globalization and uh, liberalization of the economy does not make things easier because, of course, it impacts uh, enormously the media sector as well. And media globalization in general translates 
uh, in uh, diminishing our freedom of information and in restricti restricting the uh, diversity of information. On the other hand, the right to expression and to having affordable access to the means of communication is increasingly being recognized as a fundamental human right. And experience shows that equitable access to and participation of citizens in communication means strengthens democracy in general and uh, strengthens uh, uh, the rights of uh, various communities, of minority groups, of indigenous people, and of historically, um, historically disadvantaged uh, social groups. Therefore, the community access to different communication means is crucial to creating an enabling environment for ordinary people and uh, for people uh, at the grassroots level to enter into public discourse in, and to make their concerns and voices heard. Community access is an essential prerequisite to ensure also the free flow of information to and from citizens. Community access to communication means helps to exercise the right to information about which Mr. Schmidt uh, spoke, and it is a, a really very important uh, right that all citizens should be aware of. By breaking the traditional division between, uh, let's say, broadcasters and listeners in the case of, uh, um, of television or radio, for instance, important local issues uh, could be aired, making community radio an essential partner in community development. Community access um, ensures that new languages, new formats, unheard voices, and innovative ways of uh, um, putting pressure on, on authorities uh, could be used. Thus, community media could be seen as part of a broader struggle for access to communication media and as a mechanism for social groups to pressurize um, or to, to, to voice their social and economic demands. Uh, UNESCO gives high priority in this context. UNESCO gives high priority to providing and strengthening communication and information facilities at the level of local communities. Such facilities offer basic tools for introducing and managing community center development and change. One such good example is the UNESCO's International Initiative for Community Multimedia Centers which promotes community empowerment and addresses the digital divide by combining community broadcasting with an internet and related technologies. Uh, I would only remind you to those of you who have been uh, attending the last uh, GK uh, Global Knowledge Partnership uh, Conference 3, which took place last December in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, where UNESCO uh, set up an on-site community multimedia center and an exhibition to demonstrate the concept of community, community multimedia centers um, in building uh, in practice knowledge societies. Um, just for your information, selected audio programs from uh, the live broadcasting that UNESCO um, organized uh, and internet streaming uh, are available or are uploaded on the audiovisual resources platform of UNESCO for your consultation. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that community access is important and it is um, uh, very much empowering communities um, only uh, if the condition um, of the uh, multicultural approach 
of the um, when when the different opinions are respected and taken account, when uh, various ideas are debated, and when women are not just pretty voices, um, and when words fly without any discrimination and censorship. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, getting your ideas, and if there are uh, questions, uh, maybe we can find somebody in the audience to answer, or maybe you can address some of those questions to us. We will try to answer those questions. But I want the, the rest of the session really to be a uh, truly interactive session. So please, anyone who would like to, although the room is very dark and I have difficulty seeing everyone, um, please go ahead. Who wants to volunteer first? Do we have a microphone? Sure. Ah, there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I noticed, um, well, first of all, I have, a, I have a couple compliments to yeah. share. One, I have really appreciated UNESCO's work, particularly with its 2005 um, World Report on Building Knowledge Societies, and I... I yeah, so oh. We're trying to... To uh, at me. least to see you better. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, your I, voice is very interesting, but the voice with the visual <laughs> would be even better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the 2005 Building Knowledge Societies Report, I thought, was a very important contribution um, to the international discussion on this. And um, I hope that there will be uh, future world reports and, and other works um, of, of similar stature, because I think that UNESCO's voice in this discussion is, is so important um, as bringing a, a dimension um, to the talks about information society that, that is not only technical, but really has this human perspective as well. Um, I appreciated also um, that several of you mentioned uh, the human rights perspective and Article 19 as a touchstone. Um, and i just like to ask, um, or maybe it's a comment, maybe it's a question, depending on, on how you choose to field it, um, but, but what role can um, other human rights play? And I'm thinking particularly of um, within the economic and social culture, um, rights uh, framework, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 27, which talks about the right of everyone to share in science, uh, scientific progress in technology, and also the right to take part in cultural life, which I think is particularly relevant to UNESCO's mission. Um, and I understand that as uh, pertaining to the right. That, that uh, UNESCO is also put in the world to administer, so to say, including the, the cultural rights that you were mentioning, which then again includes the right to scientific information or to enjoy the benefit from scientific research. I think that, uh, that one of the, uh, the, the key elements in UNESCO's work in, in this regard is the Convention on, uh, on, uh, on the uh, Promotion of Cultural Diversity which uh, sets up a whole set of recommendations to member states and describes certain standards that have now by, been, uh, been actually ratified by, by quite a lot. More than 100 member states have ratified this convention and have committed themselves to work alongside the principles and the recommendations given uh, in, in, in these texts. They're all uh, pointing to the fact that, uh, that states have a responsibility to protect and even to promote the cultural rights uh, of the individuals uh, in their countries. And I think when, when we look at what we're doing ourselves uh, in, in the communication and information sector, we certainly are trying to, uh, to, uh, to move alongside that without being uh, telling uh, or prescribing what should be done. We are, we're trying to stimulate, you could say, the, the pluralistic media landscape in, in, in any given country by, for instance, uh, ensuring or trying to ensure that next to the private independent media, there also is public service media or media mandated with a public service remit, I should say, uh, that there is community media, that we build capacity for indigenous groups, for marginalized groups to be able to express themselves, to give them a voice that can be, um, that can be women in some countries, that can be very poor people in other countries, that can be indigenous uh, language or cultural groups in, in other countries. So I think we try to work on all these uh, various areas uh, in order to, to promote and, and help our colleagues dealing with cultural rights. 
On the scientific issue, we have developed a network uh, on, on science journalism, trying to bring together scientists and reporters specializing on, on science in order for them to, to push forward the dissemination, the wider vulgarization, you could say, of, of scientific uh, knowledge so that more and more people can actually benefit from that. In many of the concrete uh, uh, community multimedia centers that UNESCO has established, particularly in Africa, you will see that there is a whole series of these texts or videos that, that are really trying to popularize or vulgarize uh, the, the scientific information so that it can be made immediately practical and useful for, for, for the local groups. But I think for the, uh, maybe for the, uh, uh, the copyright issues, uh, Miriam can say a few words there. Thanks. <laughs> well, I was going to say all of those are sort of shorthand ways of, of, of um, talking about and pointing to our interest very much in trying to have a better balance of intellectual property rights. Um, on the open access, certainly one of the big efforts and the reason that we're so supportive of those efforts um, the open access movement really, really is a new way of, of looking at publishing in a way that doesn't depend upon the, the, the whole copyright scheme, but rather is a way of putting out particularly the forefront has been scientific journals in a way that has them open and available from the very beginning so that they are, there's not a moratorium on when people can act, get access to them in either in print or online, um, it, it, so that they can get available, they can get them, get that kind of information from all over the world, from wherever you are, without having to pay exorbitant licenses to get the material and have them available in perpetuity in some way in a digital form. Um, that that could be the whole subject of a whole nother discussion. In terms of the intellectual property rights, let me just add one other piece, Leah, that you mentioned, and I think is really important for this this group of people. The whole um, issue of digital rights management or technological locks that are put on works, whether they're copyrighted or not, in a way that independent of, of how liberal or, or how um, uh, available materials are under a copyright regime, are still going to be locked up if the technology is put on them that prevents people from being able to, to really do anything with it. You may be able to get in and look at it, but you're not going to be able to copy it, you're not going to be able to use it, you're not going to be able to further disseminate it. And that's a, that's a real big issue to on, for online access that we're very concerned about. Yeah, well, I thought that uh, Mons, in his response, would talk about his favorite three Ds, uh, but he, he didn't. So, uh, I mean, I'm surprised that he didn't. Uh, of late, uh, you know, he's been a great promoter of the freedom of expression and its correlationship with democracy, dialogue, and development. Not many people are uh, significant saving of resources, saving of resources from the pockets of those who are in a position to pocket public resources. The corruption, basically. That the free, independent, pluralistic media is one of the primary means of preventing corruption. And if, when you prevent corruption, you allow those resources to be utilized for public good. So uh, I, I, th I thought I would provoke him, maybe he will supplement, but rather than us doing all the talking, I would like you to do the talking. So um, anybody else from the audience? Um, let, let me just chip in while the... <laughs> <laughs> I know that you can't... Well, well, no, no, I can, I can read a region uh, uh, by Professor Ansari, and he will, I think, in his trying to achieve through UNESCO, uh, but I'm actually trying to see it applied through member states. And I'm quite interested in one of the points you made just now about uh, communities uh, being able to have mediums of their own, like radio stations, television stations. 
And one of the things one hits upon is the allocation of radio frequencies mm -hmm. and how these are not allocated to exactly those groups who you would like to see um, mm -hmm. engage. Yeah. Um, to a discussion uh, just previous to this, I'd also like to hear your views on participative um, communications with regards to intellectual property rights. And to give with you regard to? IPR. Intellectual property. Oh, right. yes. Mm. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, a government actually uh, does a consultation. So this is a very simple one. Society responds. So then they publish, if you've given them permission, your response. If you go to the website, it then says, this is the copyright of the state. But it actually came from us. Hmm. Um, but the, it, when you have a participative um, sort of uh, area. Exactly mm. who does it belong to? It should not belong to anybody, otherwise it doesn't work. And the third issue I'd like to hear your views on is in an insecure world, there is in fact a reverse trend going on, whereas one side is trying to open up the information, the insecurity of society is actually trying to close it all back down again. And so we have a, a sort of a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can we, information is generated through the public discourse. Does that information belong automatically to the public or it belongs to the state, although the state may have been the facilitator? And the third one was about balance between the um, security issue and openness issue. That's how I saw your, your question. Let me try, I will pass on the relevant questions too. Uh, but the, the first one that you talked about is of great interest to me personally. So um, especially community radios. I had a life some 30 years ago in this country in radio and particularly rural radio. And at that time, um, as peop the expression goes, um, 30 years ago, I was young and foolish. Not that I'm any wiser, but, <laughs> but um, I did make a proposal at that time that the country could have as many as 560 local radios. I didn't call it community radios because at that time, state broadcasting was the only broadcasting available in this country. And um, a very senior person in the organization, uh, a technology engineer, he said, your proposal makes a lot of sense. However, I'm not sure how far it will go. Believe it or not, it took more than 30 years for the idea of community radio to be approved in this country. And there are many, there are many reasons I don't want to go into that. But at that time, I was uh, the Vice Chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University, the first university to be given the right to establish some radio stations and broadcast program without editorial control of All India Radio. And now, of course, it has been extended to community, uh, community radios. It is still in its infancy. It's still really people I'm not sure how many people are fully on board with the idea. And it's still not really a community radio. It's still um, only education, many primarily educational institutions have been allowed to run. Gradually it is happening. I'm sure it will generate its own force and things will happen. But if you're asking me, what is UNESCO's take? Yes, as my colleague Iskara talked about, that UNESCO is a strong believer in giving those that do not have voice and expression. And that's why we have been through our consultancy services, our advisory services, trying to help the governments to accept, adopt, and enact enabling policies so that these community radios or community access points, including combining radio and internet, will actually go to the level where people can generate their own content, share that, that information, benefit from that information to even generate economic activities. Now, on the question of uh, 
um, my goodness, the publicly generated information and how it should be. Marion, do you want to sure. address that? Yeah. Sure, because you, you really raise um, sort of uh, an issue that can be looked at both as a matter of law and as a matter of policy. Certainly in uh, some countries, um, I, I don't know about the majority, but in a lot of countries, uh, the, it is as a matter of law uh, that such comments made by the public on a matter of rulemaking or regulation by an agency would be a matter of public record. Uh, no question, it would be made available. Um, in some countries, uh, any government-generated information uh, as a matter of law cannot be subject to copyright. So you've got both uh, uh, administrative law and intellectual property law, copyright law, that would say that those very kinds of comments um, should, uh, should and must be available to the public. Um, as a matter of policy, it certainly seems like that's the way to go. Uh, I hope that uh, you got some answer to some of your questions, not perhaps all. Yes, please go ahead. Good. Uh, I think this is uh, really welcome by whole societies. And in the society, we need someone to lead this. Uh, and, uh, and especially the information and the knowledge. Uh, and so we, as a scientific society, a research society, we are very active to uh, join this. Uh, we are working on the, uh, especially for the uh, data, scientific data issues. Uh, so we have we work with uh, 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 with uh, several academies uh, in different countries. Uh, also in uh, in the Asia uh, uh, Science Council, uh, focus on the scientific data, open access to uh, the data issue. So between, the data is between the information and the knowledge. So so there there are between them. There are someone in the middle of this, uh, and uh, in the more, more and more scientific data comes uh, in the uh, huge uh, in the more data centers is uh, an uh, organized such kind of data. So how to uh, make uh, all the kind of data available uh, to, to be used. And uh, so we developed the decentralized network networks uh, based on the World Data Center. So now ICSU in, uh, in the reform from World Data Center into the World Data System. Uh, so let's uh, focus on the how, uh, uh, how to make the data available to better services. Uh, especially for the developing countries. I think that's, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, I'm working on that and very, very uh, willing to work with the UNESCO uh, on the, the, the data issue. Yeah. So I have a question uh, is uh, uh, about the is, uh, UNESCO is lead on this. How about the, this is a government, uh, intergovernment uh, uh, agency and uh, another uh, NGOs, uh, so some, uh, for example, ICSU, uh, CODATA, uh, so XT, uh, this is uh, uh, non-government uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. How ICSU can, uh, how the UNESCO can work uh, with other uh, uh, knowledge and uh, uh, science community to work on this? So mm -hmm. this is my question. Um. Very briefly, can I, I mean, thank you for your comment, including, among other you know, entities, the scientific community, and um, I believe that information and communication technology and the work that we do can contribute not only to creation of new knowledge, but also preservation of old knowledge and dissemination of new knowledge or new old knowledge that exists today. Uh, the question of uh, UNESCO in fact, has over 400 NGOs that are registered with it and has a long tradition of working with the NGO sector. And you mentioned particularly ICSU and CODATA. They have, we have had long-standing partnership with both these agencies. So we look forward to continued cooperation, if not further strength and cooperation between CODATA, ICSU, and UNESCO. Uh, yes, please. 
<coughs> the lady in yellow sari. Yeah, thank you. It's dumb. And after knowing that, I am really tempted to uh, share my observations and ask for your, I mean, suggestions. Uh, as you are well aware, uh, that uh, the Indian universities, those who are located in far remote places, are not having uh, adequate resources to support quality researches. And I hope that you would be agreeing that all, all, all the issues that have been discussed here uh, about the uh, using ICT, especially for indigenous people, for rural people, and the people who are considered to be excluded section of the society, needs a lot of research researches, particularly by those, those researchers who are located in the areas dominated by these societies. I belong to one of the universities that is located in Chhattisgarh, uh, state of India. So during the last four years, we have found that we have been benefited a lot by uh, this, uh, I mean, online, online resources. Uh, many of the organizations like uh, Global Development Network of Japan have provided us researchers a free access to their research database. But still, there is a lot of research related to all these issues that is going on, uh, that is very relevant, that, that is very use, useful, but that is not very accessible to us because we don't have financial resources to get to that uh, research. So I just want to, uh, I mean, uh, share with you, us, you, mm. that if there are any planning, if there is any planning from the side of UNESCO to support research resources and to uh, get engaged in the capacity building of the researchers who are located in mm. such remote areas. Thank you. I think that's a very, which is part of a UGC initiative based in uh, uh, New Delhi. Uh, has been working in providing connectivity to educational institutions and also yesterday you heard the minister uh, mention that the, they, they are establishing a knowledge network and that knowledge network would be incomplete if it does not have uh, adequate provision to connect researchers not only in universities but you know in, in this country a large number of uh, research institutions have been established not only by Council of Scientific Industrial Research, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and many other entities. So that's one, that is the national capacity. Yes, it is true that today the connectivity is poor. It's painfully slow, including this uh, convention center, but it is bound to uh, get better. No question. As the connectivity increases, as the you know the technology advances, fortunately in this country, you know people are technology savvy. But that alone is not sufficient for for them to benefit. There has to be a the infrastructure in place. But one good thing about the technology is that you don't have to have necessarily only national resources. As you said yourself, that you are getting information from Japanese networks. And that is one thing, you know, one thing that I can mention is that we have been working with an organization like CERN to make available scientific journals to uh, universities that cannot afford them. You know, it is very difficult for, uh, for universities in Africa or anywhere else for the, you know, in remote areas such as Chhattisgarh to, to pay for scientific journals and certainly, you know, even to receive them on time. So that we, we, we have been working with them to make available free of cost online scientific journals. Those, some of those initiatives do exist. And of course, as I also mentioned, that it is not only the ICT is not only help in receiving information, but as a young scientist working in Chhattisgarh, there is no reason why you should not be able to share your own knowledge and expertise with the rest of the world. Any, any other questions? Yes, please. It's democracy, development, and dialogue. And this is what uh, UN Solution Exchange does. Uh, I work with the ICT for development community. And like this, we have 11 other communities of practice. Uh, and we have members from all over uh, India and abroad 
working, these are development practitioners working on the issue. So we connect development practitioners from all over India and abroad to discuss issues of concern. So they discuss their problem and they, uh, and they uh, find solutions for those problems. So I just thought that, you know, um, I'd share this experience that communities of practice, online communities of practice, uh, play a huge role in, um, in enabling sharing of knowledge and uh, bringing public tacit knowledge on the forefront where uh, about solutions are also uh, discussed. Well, thank you very much for sharing that information with us. I have to say about UNESCO's role in, in this process, I, I think it's really important that we don't only hear from the supply side voices on the internet, but that we really talk about the uh, essential commitments that need to be made to freedom of expression in the internet environment, um, the essential role of uh, community-based access centers, community multimedia centers, radio in particular. Um, yesterday we heard some very outspoken comments from Hamadan Toure from the ITU. I, I'd really appreciate hearing from people from UNESCO uh, what your perspectives are on the future of the IGF and how it can work better for us as a multi-stakeholder forum. Mm -hmm. 